Good. <laughs> good afternoon po. Magandang hapon. Good, good afternoon to everyone. It's another blessed day that the Lord has given us to study, learn from His Word and uh, be blessed by God because He inhabits the praises of His people. Thank you, Praise and Worship, for leading us in those beautiful uh, songs. And it's another opportunity for me to share the Word of God to you. And uh, our topic is about hope, right? And uh, so I was uh, contemplating on, on this. I said, what do we go for, right? It's, it's the object of our hope, something that we could rely upon. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, you hope for something which, you know, the person whom you are hoping for is not reliable, right? You hope that this person would do something, but you know he's not reliable, right? So you are putting yourself in a false hope, hoping for something that you know is not going to happen, right? That's why I have this fourfold witness found in John chapter 5, verse 31. But before that, I would like to read a passage in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. This is in the New King's Version. And this is what it says, Romans 15, chapter 4, uh, Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before, were written for your learning, that we, through the patience and comfort, of the scriptures, might and hope. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, again, O oh Lord, we are blessed to be here. You brought us here, O oh Lord God, as a family to worship you, to praise you, O oh Lord, and give you all the glory and honor that you deserve. We thank you, O oh Lord God, for everyone who has come here, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that we may be blessed by you, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us, O oh God. Speak to our hearts and our mind, O oh God, and that we may understand and that we may take hold of this hope that you have promised to everyone who set their hope in you, O oh God. We thank you, Lord God, and we pray, O Lord, that you would bless us this afternoon. And again, O oh Lord, the glory and honor and praise to you belong in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you have your Bible, you can turn your Bible in John chapter 5. I would like to read it. The fourfold witness. Now, in the Old Testament, you know, in the time of Moses, you know, it's only valid when you have at least two witnesses. Right? You need at least two witnesses. If, if it's just one, it's not valid. It's like, you know, it's your word against my word, right? So, yeah, that's not valid. At least you have two or three. Uh, it's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Meaning to say, if you have two witnesses, case closed. Okay? So, that is the Old Testament way. But now, here in John chapter 5, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. How, it, how, it, how, this, how did this discussion start out? Right? It all started out when Jesus healed a crippled man in the pool of Bethesda, right? They call it the pool of mercy. And this is where the people gathered and, you know, when according to what they believe in, you know, when somebody, when an angel come down, comes down and stir up the water, anyone who jumps first to the water will get healed. Right? But actually, if you, if you look at the 
uh, old manuscript, the old manuscript, or the older, the oldest manuscript that they have, that portion is not there. That portion. Uh, some Bible scholars believe that this is uh, uh, put in there in the later manuscript just to explain why the people are doing that. This is what they think. That the angel steers the water and anybody, it's, it's like a superstition, right? That they thought that if you jump in there when the angel stir up the water, then, you know, you, you get healed, right? So, that portion of the, of the scripture is not actually found in the older manuscript. So, some Bible scholars said they, somebody put it there just to explain why the people gathered there and thought that, you know, this is something special. An angel comes down there every time, now and then, right? So now, Jesus healed this man. He was crippled for, I think, 38 years, right? He said, you know, I cannot stand. You know, I cannot, I cannot go there. Before, before, you know, before I knew it, somebody has jumped in, jumped in there already. But the Lord Jesus Christ healed this crippled man who's crippled for 38 years. The only thing is, it's, it's Sabbath. Again, there's the technicality. And the religious leaders, you know, they didn't like it. Because, you know, why do you have to do it during the Sabbath? You can do it any day, you know, when you are bringing the Sabbath. They didn't see that the man for 30, 30 years is suffering and he was healed during the Sabbath. All they see is, it was the Sabbath. Right? They didn't, they didn't even care for the crippled man who was, you know, if I am a crippled, I would like to stand up, be able to stand up any, any time, right? And said, okay, uh, I'm going to heal tomorrow, I'll come back tomorrow. I want to be healed now, right? But they didn't see that. They didn't see the suffering of this man. All they care about is, oh, it's not, not allowed because it's Sabbath. So, there was, you know, a discussion between Jesus and these religious leaders. And they were saying to Jesus that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're testifying about yourself. You know, if testimony is not valid, if you're just talking about yourself. And then it came to this. When Jesus said in verse 31, if you have your Bible, turn to verse 31, 531. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. He was agreeing with the Old Testament that if only one is witnessing, it's not valid. So Jesus is agreeing. But in verse 32, this is what he said. There is another, right? If only me is witnessing, okay, it's okay, don't believe. But there is another one. There is another one who bear witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. He has sent to John, and he has become witness to the truth. It says there, and there's another one there. It says that, yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp. You were willing for a time to rejoice in his life. So now what Jesus is saying, you know, okay, my witness is not valid, but there's another one. And you know this man, right? Not only that you know this man, you know, when you, when you, you take a witness, you have to make sure that your witness is a reliable witness. You know, you cannot take a witness who is a criminal, we see crook. Even in our court nowadays, you know, oh, I have, a testi uh, I have a testimony from this man, and then they check this man. Oh, he's a crook. He's a thief. He's a liar. How can you rely on that man, right? But Jesus is saying here, you know this man. You know him, right? He's someone who is reliable. And a person whom you know, even from the beginning, is big. God is, 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 the God, hand of God is upon me. That's what it says, it, it says there, you know, what kind of child is this? The hand of the Lord is with him. Even when 
John was born, you know, it was all a miracle. And all people, you know, they, they knew that this child is a special child. They knew that. Even, there's another por portion in when John is baptizing. Actually, Jesus asked this question. Where does John's baptism, you know, where? Is it from heaven or is it from, you know, just from... He says there, why, do, why then did you not believe in him? Because they couldn't answer. Is it from God or is it from man? They couldn't believe, right? And then, but it says there, why then do you did not believe him? But if I say from man, we feel that for the multitude, for all counts, Jesus, I uh, John as a prophet. You know, all, all the people know, right? All the people know that this man is from God. Even Herod himself, when he was about to execute him because John spoke against against uh, Herod the Tetrarch, not Herod the Great, Herod the Tetrarch, no, took his brother's wife, and the wife didn't like it. So Herod, okay, put him to jail, right? But he doesn't want to execute John. Why? He feared him. Because he knew that John is a servant of God. He's a prophet. Everybody knows that. So Jesus is saying now, there is one who bore witness of me. And you know him all. All of you know him. And his witness is true. Although Jesus says there, no. He says there that, you know, that uh, uh, I do not receive testimony from men. But, you know, bear with me. You know this guy. This guy testified about me. And John said, you know, what John said, you know, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There you go. You have one. One witness. Okay. That's not enough. One witness is not enough. There's another one. Jesus said there. But I have a greater witness than John. For the work which the Father has given me to finish every work that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Okay. Forget about John. Forget about the testimony of a man. Just look around on all the things that I have done. All the miracles. All the wonders. You know, I fed 5,000. The other one, 4,000, you know, only men. So the 4 and 5,000, those are only men. Don't say that they are all men in there. There are men and women and children. So there are more than 5,000 who were fed. A lot of people saw this. They witnessed this. They know that Jesus has the power to heal blind people, you know, cure the blind man. Everybody witnessed this one as we have discussed this in John chapter 9, you know. Because people does not believe. You know, even if you give them proof after proof, people, you know, still don't believe. So Jesus said, okay, I have John as a witness. Okay, I have this works, you know, the miracle that proves what I claim is true. You know, it's not something that I just made it up. For us believers in Christ, to those who believe in Christ, you know, it's not that it's not just uh, just like you know I say so. Just believe me, without proof. No. For us believers, everything has a basis. It's it's not just oh because brother Willie really says so or pastor Dick says so. It's not like that. There is a basis for everything that we believe, right? It's not just something like other religion, you know, oh, you just claim this and claim this and claim that. But there's no proof for us. You know, God did not expect us just to believe. He shows proof. When God calls somebody, He shows proof of His approval. It's not just, oh, just believe this guy, that's it. Anybody can claim that it's a prophet of God. That's why Jesus said, you know, be careful 
Because after me, many will come and will proclaim themselves as prophet and apostles. You know, and sometimes, you know, I, I see some people, they put the label, oh, I'm not that. I am not a pastor. I am an apostle. It seems to be that, you know, he thinks that, you know, apostle is higher, uh, ranking, you know. They still think like that. Oh, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher. I'm a pastor. Oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm a bishop. I'm not a bishop. I'm an apostle. Right? It, it's not the title. It's the function. You know? Doesn't matter what they call you. John didn't brag about being a prophet. Then when, when they ask him, are you the prophet? No. No. But he is a prophet. He didn't brag about it. What did he say? I'm just a voice. Crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way. Right? It's not all that you know, title and glamour. It's about function and service. So forget about the title. Right? It's all about function and service. We serve a mighty God. It's not a hierarchy. Actually, if you want to be in the hierarchy, you have to serve. You have to go down. Right? So Jesus does all these things. Okay, you need proof. It's not only one miracle, two miracles, three miracles. It's a lot of miracles. The blind man, the lame, the dumb, even the dead. Has raised the dead. Right? Feed 5,000, miraculous catch of fish, the, wine, the water turning to wine. One miracle after a miracle. These are proof that I am what I claim to be the son of man the son of God so now two witness, that's enough okay, that's enough because according to the scripture you only need two right? I said, okay two is not enough okay, I give you another one there you go the father but they would say, you know well, we don't see the father you know, we, we don't see him like a, nobody sees the Father, you know, and live, right? He doesn't show himself. Now, why did Jesus say, and the Father himself, who sent me, has testified of me? Because even in the Old Testament, you know, when God sent prophets or holy men of God, it follows miraculous things. Why? Because only God could do those miraculous things like that one. Elijah, right? What did Elijah say? Okay, make up your mind. If God is God, then follow God. If Baal is God, then follow Baal. Make up your mind. And then he challenges the prophets of Baal. There are a lot of them. So he said, okay, since you're a lot of people in there, you, you, you start doing this uh, sacrifice. But no fire. Just put the, the offering in there and, you know, pray and if God send, whoever is sending the fire, then that's the God. That's the real one. Right? Imagine that that fire, that fire from heaven is already a miracle, you know? The miracle you know fire coming from heaven? How many times have you seen uh, fire coming from heaven? <laughs> I've never seen one. Okay? Now, that's a miracle already. The fire coming from heaven. Now, the fire landing where the offering is, is another miracle. You know, the fire can come from heaven and it might land anywhere. Right? But the fire landed exactly where the offering is. And it consumed the offering. Actually, to make it foolproof, Elijah even said, okay, put, put water in there. Oh, okay, we already put, no, 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 no. Put, put more. Then they put more. I said, no, 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 Three times, you know, put water until the water overflows. It overflows. It's in the, 
You have no excuse, you know the water is overflowing. And then he prayed. And the fire from heaven came down and consumed everything. Even the water dries up. Right? Which proves that Elijah is a man sent by God. It has the seal of approval of God. That's why Jesus is saying, the Father who sent me is a witness because I couldn't do this except God. No. It's with me. That's why the blind man, remember the blind man chapter 9? They were saying, oh, you are, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, you, you, you are this uh, disciple, you, you're just saying good things about him. He said, he said this is a bad man. How could a bad, a bad man take a blind see? You know, even common sense, you know, if he's a bad man, how could he make me see? We know that, right? So you want proof? Okay, there, there's a proof. There's a proof of my calling, you know. Elijah has proof. Another one, who could do this? Who could split the Red Sea? Even the people nowadays could not split the Red Sea. It is a miracle. It is a wonder that nobody could do. It's not possible. And it's only possible if the hand of God is with you. That's why Jesus is saying here, you know, now I have given you three. I have given you John, although John, okay, let's say John is a man, we cut him out. You still have the miracles. You still have the Father who sent me, who testified of me by you know, these wonders that I am able to do. He's still not convinced. Still not convinced. You know, people, sometimes, I don't know if you have met, but I have met some people, no matter how you explain things to them, they still don't believe. They still don't believe. You know, even if you put the, all the facts in, in front of them, they still wouldn't believe. Now, okay, we have already three. There were already three witnesses. John, the prophet, the miracles of the Lord, and the Father. Okay, already three. That's enough. But no, I give you another one. The scriptures. The scriptures tells about the coming Messiah, although I only put two here. We could find hundreds of them in the in the scripture. In the Old Testament. From Genesis and to Malachi, you will see, you will see proof of Jesus calling. That's why Jesus says there, you search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are the one that testifies of me. Right? These are the one that testifies of me. He said, you search the scripture, for you think in them you will you will have eternal life this is a notion when i was reading this this is a notion that they thought you know if they study the scripture memorize it follow every single piece of it that they would have eternal life you think you think that you will have eternal life by you know Searching the scriptures, studying them, and learning from them. But they missed the point. They missed the point. Because the scriptures tells about me, Jesus said. And your salvation is actually found not in the scripture, but in me. The scripture already tells you where your salvation lies. But you focus on the scripture and you think if you follow all this, you will be saved. Jesus said, that's what you think. Salvation is not memorizing this, learning this, knowing everything in here. Even if you memorize, learn everything in the Bible, if you don't have Christ, you are not saved. Even if you only know one verse and you have Christ, you are saved. But it doesn't mean when you are saved, you will neglect the word of God. Of course not. 
You know, when you become saved, you become more hungry. You want to know what God is saying. You know, if you want to build a relationship, you have to know the person. If you want to know God, there is only one way to know God. Through His Scripture. Right? It testifies of me. Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgression, curse, crushed for our iniquity, punished, that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Imagine that this verse is in the book of Isaiah, and the book of Isaiah, found in the Dead Sea Scroll, is complete. The whole Isaiah scroll is complete from verse 1 until to the last verse. It's a complete scroll. Right? And if you read this one, Isaiah 53, to the Jew, they say that this is, if you don't tell them, just, just read the passage, they will say, oh yeah, I know, this is in your New Testament. But then you don't know that this is in the Old Testament. It's in their Tanakh. It's in their Hebrew Bible. Why they do, why they don't know Hebrew? Uh, sorry, Isaiah 53. It's because when they read the scripture, they jump from 52 to 54. They do not read this. This is what they call the forbidden chapter. The Jew does not read this. They skip it. Why do they skip it? Because if you, if you don't know, you know, when you read this one, you're not aware what it is, you read it, automatically you will know that this verse speaks of Christ. Automatic. When you, you hear that, you know, somebody was pierced for our transgression, you know, was killed, he was wounded. For the penalty of sin. Right there and there, you would know this is speaking of Christ. That's why uh, when I was seeing this video from this uh, Messianic Jew talking about talking to some Jewish people, they said, Oh, this is from the New Testament. <laughs> no, this is from your Tanakh. This is from your Holy Scripture. I said, I've never heard that before. Yes, it never happened before because the Jews does not read this portion. They skip it. Right? But it's there. Why do they skip it? I mean to say, what, 52 is holy and 53 is not and then 54 is holy again? No. All scriptures are inspired by God. They were given to us so that we may learn from it. That's why the first uh, verse that I read is that it says there, you know, the things that were written before were written for our learning. That we may through patience and comfort of the scriptures might take hope. We have hope. But our hope is not baseless. Our hope is a basis. But now, we're going to say, well, this is the, the time of Jesus. There's another one. Genesis. I put enmity between you and the woman, between you, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This prophecy is about the coming Messiah, the person who will redeem people, who will bring back the relationship, the destroyed relationship. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, right? Some people say, oh, God is so harsh, he throw them out. Throw them out of the garden. It was so harsh. They, they just eat the fruit. It's so harsh you throw them out. One thing they they didn't realize is that God loves them so much He wants to redeem mankind because if He did not throw them out and they ate the you know the fruit that gives eternal life, they will be eternally living and still be wicked. There is no redemption. People miss that. The reason why God is, you know, put them out because He doesn't want them to have eternal life in that status, in their sinful status. 
Imagine, they are in their simple status and they live forever. What's gonna happen? There's no redemption. That's why God has, you know, put them aside. I have a plan of redemption. That's why he, he mentioned it. He mentioned it here in Genesis. God has already have a plan of redeeming man back to God. That's why he says, okay, you cannot eat of the fruit because I have a plan. That's what it is. So even in the beginning, God has a plan already. Right? In your life, God has a plan already. Right? Now, some people will say, well, that is in the time of Jesus. Now we don't have John the Baptist. No, he's dead. We don't see the Father. We don't see Jesus. We don't see Jesus doing miracles. We don't see the Father and we don't see John. All we are left with is what? The Scripture. But people will say, oh, the Scripture is not reliable. The scripture is just made by man. Written by man. It's not reliable. Some people say it's not reliable. But, let's see. It's not reliable. There. I like, I love archaeology. Especially biblical archaeology. I may be presenting you a few. But there are hundreds and hundreds of proof. But these are only a few of them. Archaeology proves the Bible. If you look closer on this, this is stone. And if you read, you could read what is written in there. It says there's some kind of, I think Latin, Tiberium Pilatus. This is a stone that they found that, you know, in the beginning they thought that Pilate is a fictional, you know, it's just a fictional guy. He's not a real guy. And then they found out this stone, there is an inscription of his name, Pilatus, Pilate, the ruler of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. This is the guy who washed his hands. There you go. It's true that there is a person named Pilate. The stones do not lie. Right? Now, again, this one. For many, many years, they say that the house of David is not real. It's like King Arthur. You know King Arthur in, in England? It's a fable. It's a myth. It's not real. Right? So people, they could not trace any, anything to David. Right? Until they found this Tel Dan steel. This is it. They call it Tel Dan steel because a tell is like a mound. It's a mound, right? If you go to Israel, you would see a lot of mounds. But sometimes, underneath those mounds are archaeological, you know, some structure, right? And this is found in Dan, which is in the northern part of Israel. They found this one, and there is an inscription that says there, the house of David. There you go, right? The house of David. Meaning to say, the house of David exists. There is such person named David. Meaning to say, the dynasty of David. Meaning to say, the guy, you know, the sons and daughters and, you know, all the siblings, all the previous kings, all coming up from David. Meaning to say, this dynasty, the Davidic dynasty, exists. It's not a myth. It's true, right? And the thing is, this is written in Aramaic. You need to say they're not, they're not Jews who wrote this, right? So it's not even the Jews writing King David. It's somebody else writing David. Now, this one, Amarna tablets. What are these Amarna tablets? These Amarna tablets are coming from Egypt. They are coming from Egypt. Nobody really knows how to read this in the beginning and then later on they, 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 they learn how to decipher this. They, they're cuneiform, they call it. Wages, right? Interestingly, when I read this, I have an article about this Amarna tablets. 
is that when Moses wrote the five books, no, the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Numbers, when Moses wrote those books, right, it was already around 200 to 400 years before, uh, I mean, the distance or the time, they say, from Abraham to the event of Sodom and Gomorrah is around 250 to 450. They are not sure exactly, but it's a long, long time because Moses is writing, you know, the account in the past, okay? But when Moses wrote about Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah does not exist at all. There is no history of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is no place known as Sodom and Gomorrah during Moses' time. The city is completely forgotten. Right? There is no account of Sodom and Gomorrah when Moses wrote Genesis. Now the question is, how did Moses know that there is a place known uh, as Sodom and Gomorrah when that place does not exist anymore? during his lifetime, many, many years, more than 200 or 400 years, nobody would know. Nobody keeps record except the Egyptians. And they dug these tablets. There are a lot of them. And there is one tablet which is a communication between the area from the Levant. Levant means the Israelite area. And Egyptians. Well, there is a communication mentioning Sodom and Gomorrah. See, the stones don't lie. How did Moses know? How did Moses know this place doesn't exist? It's because God told him. How would you write if he doesn't know? Right? Moses wrote about the flood. How did, how did he know uh, Moses knew the flood? The flood happened in the past. Right? And again, this account is coming from non-Jewish. These are Egyptians who wrote about the account in the Bible. It's not the only one. Message still. Mention Ahab king of Israel, which is found in the book of Kings. This is the bad king, you know? <laughs> it's very bad king. It's the worst, I think, in the, Israel, in, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel. The thing is, this is found from Moab. These are enemy of Israel. And they're the ones who mentioned the young king of Israel from this Mesha still. Mesha is the king of Moab during his time. Another one. Sennacherib Prism. This is Assyrian origin, which mentioned King Ahaz of Judah, also found in the book of Kings. Okay? These are not coming from Jewish sources. Next, Cyrus Cylinder, I think. She's a really no sir, him. <laughs> Cyrus. Cyrus is a Persian, right? Cyrus Cylinder, found this one is in, in, in England. I don't know how it ended up in there. <laughs> it's better it's safe there, right? <laughs> so, this one also, Bibakao of the, you know, the captivity. Mentioned in the Bible, right? This one, this is Hezekiah's seal. You know, when you seal a wax, you know, heat it up and then put your signet ring. This is a bull, they call it a bull, but this is a seal. And it's mentioned the name of Hezekiah, I don't know if that one because I cannot read it. I, that one or the one, the one, right? But it says there Hezekiah. They done this one. This is just a small, very small, and they found it in Israel. Another one, the oldest menorah inscription. This is the oldest menorah inscription. And guess what? Where did they found this one? There. This is the oldest known menorah inscription. Where did they found this one? Guess where? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. How did they end up in there? 
It's in the Bible. Right? Hagar is, when, when, when God said, you know, uh, Sinai is in Arabia, I think mentioned in the book of Galatians. Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It's in Arabia, not in Egypt. And that proves that it's true. Because how did this inscription of this menorah end up in Saudi Arabia? Right? Now, what's my point? With all of this, archaeology proves our scripture to be reliable. Nobody has ever proven this wrong with archaeology. They have not found anything in archaeology that says the Bible is wrong. Right? There are thousands and thousands of artifacts and discoveries that prove that our Bible is reliable, historically reliable. If you're just talking about reliability, historically, it's reliable. The heart of Jesus can be found not only in the Bible, you could find it in the writings of Josephus, Tacitus, Tortilla, forgot the name of the other one. One Greek, one Roman, one Jew. Every account written about, you know, they, they wrote about Jesus. And they say Jesus is not true. He's a fictional guy. No, it's true. Because non-Christian wrote about him. Like what I've shown here. There are, there, are, there are Persian, there are Assyrians, there are Moabites, there are Egyptians who wrote about what the scripture wrote. That's why it gives us comfort. It gives us encouragement, you know. When we base our hope on what the scripture promised. Because we know that the scripture is reliable. This is the only one that we have now. We don't have John. The Lord is not here anymore. And we don't have the Lord because wonderful miracles. All we rely is the scripture, but we all know that the scripture is true. Now, what I'm saying is, when we share this to other people, even if you show them all this, some people still will not believe. They will not believe. And why don't they don't believe? It is not a matter of intellectual. It's not about intellectual. You know, they don't have the capacity to, to understand. The problem is moral. They could not take what the scripture is saying because they are living a life that is not pleasing to God. But that doesn't stop us to share the hope that we have. Right? Because our hope is assured. It's not something that is, you know, maybe, maybe not. Our hope is assured because the one who promised us does not lie. And the one that holds us, you know, the one that keeps us, is God himself. Let us pray. But again, again, Lord, we thank you for this day, O oh God, as you have shown us that your scriptures O Lord, the scripture that you have given us are reliable and they are true. They are given to us, O Lord, for, Lord God, for teaching, O Lord, and teaching us to live a righteous life, O God, that is well pleasing to you. And that we may learn from it, that we may use it as a guide in our lives, O God, and to, 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 to know you more in a personal way, O God, we pray. That we spend time, O Lord God, in reading it, and studying it. May you put that thirst and hunger in our heart to know you more in a personal way. And that we may be able to share this, O Lord, to those people who doesn't know you yet, O God. We pray, O Lord, that you would give us the courage, O God, to speak up on what we believe in with regards to our faith, and that we may share the hope that you have assured us, these people, we have given burden to us, O God. 
guide our steps, O Lord, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would, you know, lead us and use us for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.